Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here, especially on this rainy day that turned out to be. Um, I want to really start off by thanking the Wolf Institute for allowing us to be here today, and especially to Gaston Alonzo and Kiana and Fatima and everyone sort of working together and assisting us to put this event on for you today. I also would like to thank all the departments that sponsored this event and the instructors and students that are showing up here today as part of their class. I really love seeing this place packed and packed with so many different disciplines. It's really lovely. So before we get started into our panel discussion, I really just want to hold space and begin with a land acknowledgement. Brooklyn College exists on unceded territory stolen from the Canarsie and Nyack, subgroups of the indigenous Lenape people. That ongoing theft, along with stolen blood and work of enslaved Africans, facilitates our presence. We pay respects to elders past, present, and future who have stewarded this land. We recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist and uphold their sacred cultures. We know that this acknowledgement is neither sufficient nor complete, but it is part of a process of learning to become more thoughtful and respectful. So thank you for being here again. So before we get started for our discussion, I'd like to just introduce our panel. I feel a little bit like James Lipton in Inside the Actor's Studio, so I apologize. <laughs> Firstly, I want to introduce um, Dr. Melanie, sorry, Melissa Friedling. See, I'm so nervous, I think I'm part of the actor studio. Professor Friedling is an associate professor of filmmaking and the director of Master in Media Studies degree program at the New School, right here in New York. She is a film and media artist, scholar, and educator interested in the mediated jumble of human and more than human matter. Her creative work has been presented at numerous international festivals, screening venues, galleries, and museums. She's been awarded fellowships from McDowell, Yadu, and the International Studio and Curatorial Program. She's the recipient of a Fulbright Award and artist grants from the New York City Women's Fund for Media, Music, and Theater, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the New York State Council for the Arts. Her writing on film, art, and culture has been published widely, including essays in the Journal of Environmental Media, Portable Gray, Flash Art International, After Image, and Discourse, as well as a book, Recovering Women, Rhetoric, Feminisms, and Addiction, printed by Westview Press in 2000. In addition to her extraordinary accomplishments, she's also a Brooklynite and a fellow neighbor. Kara Kadu is joining us from Indiana, where she is an associate professor of history and cinema and media studies at Indiana University Bloom. She researches, writes, and teaches about film, media, and social movements in 19th and 20th century American history. Her first book, Envisioning Freedom, Cinema and the Building of Modern Black Life, printed by Harvard University Press, was a Huffington Post best film book selection a slate great books you should have heard about choice, and a recipient of the 2015 biennial Vincent P. DeSantis Prize for the best book on the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. And she was also a finalist for the Jane Jacobs Urban Communication Book Prize. She's currently writing a history of early Native American filmmaking and exhibition and a biography of the actor, writer, and film producer Noble Johnson. I'm really grateful and privileged to be here today to have this discussion with you both. I'd like to first just start and pose a question to Mel and ask, what was the origin story of this fantastic project? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Gaston and the Wolf Institute, um, Fatima and Kiana. Can you not hear me? Should I, should I lift it? Um, yeah. Okay. I don't. Okay. Uh, so, so I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll complicate the question just a little bit by like saying like origin stories are like 
complicated. Yeah. Right? So uh, hopefully my film like suggests a little bit about that as well. But yeah, I'll tell you a story about I think one story I will tell about how I started this um, was that I live in the neighborhood. Um, but actually, this this project started oh, 14 years ago, 2010. Um, I actually had just finished another film that um, that was about the uh, media that I encountered, like found media like repurposed or used used for purposes that it wasn't meant to be used uh, in my neighborhood, and it started me thinking about uh, about exactly a project about that, thinking about finding media being used for other purposes, which I seem to stumble across uh, quite a lot, um, and also confining the the space of my investigation to the to my immediate like neighborhood home midwood. Um, and then so I had found out about um, this this space that used to be a, a film studio, a, a, you know, a cornerstone of, of American cinema. Um, that actually I hadn't really heard much about. I dedicated my much of my life to uh, to, the, to to making film and studying film, and I didn't know much about the Vitagraph. Um, but it, and it turned out it was right down the street from from where I lived on Avenue M, um, you know, in 14th Street. Is you know, if you guys go out on the Q train or the B train um, towards Coney Island, you see the Vitagraph smokestack that's in the film like lots and lots of times, um, and it still says Vitagraph and you know, look for it next time you drive by or go by on the train. Anyway, so I, I go there. I'm fascinated. This is so cool. Nobody knows about it. And what it was and what the site was being um, used for or repurposed for uh, was uh, a, a, an Orthodox girls school, a yeshiva school um, for girls. So it was functioning as a, a you know, elementary through high school. Um, and the um, the principal, the the students didn't really know much about the fact that their building used to be a, a, a silent film studio. Across the street, um, also, I didn't know, uh, and I couldn't believe no, that I didn't know this. They were shooting um, "As the World Turns," the soap opera, which some of, which is you know probably before some of your time, but it stopped. It went dark in 2010, kind of exactly when I started making this. Film. Um, so there was like lots of media stuff happening very close here in Midwood. But once I started um, doing a little research into, into the history of it, um, it became kind of complicated. You know, I, start, I, I immediately learned from doing some interviews that um, Jay Stewart Blackton, one of the co-founders of the science studios, um, you know, had, you know, had ideas and even probably actions that that would were one would today find quite harmful or despicable even um in terms of his um his his positions related to race and particularly anti-semitism um but he also you know in my again history and training as in in film he was the founder of animation or at least one of the four founders of animation so it sort of complicated my whole relationship to what I knew um, and what I understood about um, about my practice and, and and the history of practice that I was involved in. Um, so the, what I started to do is, you know, talk to people and record interviews and commit to just sort of um, being on the site and, and filming on the site. Um, and and then it kind of kept going on and on. And the the building was the building was sold um, in I want to say 2014. And the the so the yeshiva school sold the building to commercial developers. So then I sort of also got involved in community efforts to like you know preserve some of the building or preserve at least the smokestack, um, uh, which is where the news clip comes from. And you know, but but I also that I always also had ambivalent feelings about what do we do about making a monument to this thing that also has a complex past. I also had young children, so I wasn't like moving very quickly in terms of making this film. So so it allowed me the time to see the transformation of the site over time. Um, so that 
became part of the film. And I also kept in all the, uh, every time I would ask somebody about why this, why this site is important to them, they would tell a very different story, whether I talked to people um, who had owned businesses on the street, or if I talked to um, a historian, or if I talked to um, somebody who was interested in, in film preservation, like the Vitaphone people, um, or if I talked to an archaeologist, they all have very different relationships to the site. And some of them can con conflict, some of them tell stories that even in the film are, you know, are contradict each other. Um, and so I thought this would be um, a way for me to sort of investigate a, you know, how a site uh, that that is actually very familiar to me is also um, an entryway for telling a story about complexities of, of, um, of the American experience and even the experience of, 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 of media as we know it. Thanks, that's a great origin story. Um, and as you said, most origin stories are complex. So yes. <laughs> yeah, I could tell a whole nother one. But. <laughs> um, so in the reading by Hitamo and Parika that was provided for some of the students here today, they really get into the fact that media archaeology shouldn't be confused with archaeology as a discipline or anthropological archaeology. And so the conversations that you and I have had, Mel, being a participant in this film, watching this film now several times, I can't help but see the similarities between the two. And I almost think that maybe it should be a subdiscipline or maybe even a cousin or something mm -hmm. to that effect. Um, the overlap of theory and methods is really remarkable. And we've had conversations about that. But what strikes me the most is something you just brought up in the origin story, is this aspect of storytelling. Archaeology, in essence, is storytelling. People think it's about objects and science, but it's really about telling narratives of the past. And both archaeologies really excavate this forgotten, neglected, and silenced past, creating these counter stories. There is sort of a different way of seeing history, right, through different types of lenses. Um, so I wanted to just provide two little clips for uh, folks that are here today, especially for ones that did not see the entire film yet. You must see it. Fantastic. Um, the first one here provides a more traditional archaeological lens to exploring history. The law of superposition kind of works like a layer cake. Um, so essentially, the the layers at the bottom should be older than the layers at the top. I say should because in urban settings you have a lot of um, building, removal, rebuilding, etc. And because of that, sometimes those layers get shifted. And you can start to see them in the soils because you can read what's called the profile. And the profile is essentially a, a side of a unit. So you can start to see the differences in the soil and the stratigraphy, and sometimes they might go just like that nice little layer cake, and other times you might see, particularly in urban settings, this swirl of a mess, and you have to try to decipher what it is. I'm going to go and move on to the other aspect of excavating, which is the sifting portion, where you use a sifter. This is sort of the typical one with one quarter inch screens to sift the dirt away from any of the material that may be located. Ooh, dusty. Now I want to show a second clip, which is later in the film, that describes it from a more media perspective, media studies perspective.
My name is William Uricchio, professor at MIT in a program called Comparative Media Studies. I'm really fascinated by the moments when technological capacity and possibility coalesces into something cultural and becomes a medium that we come to know. What capacities are tapped and which are untapped? Because what's often interesting is that those, those paths not taken come back. I mean, they persist. Paths not taken that come back again in another medium or things that are sidetracked and picked up later on in something that we think of as completely different. What you see is kind of a spiral through time of media forms intermingling, twisting out of these genealogies is such a fascinating thing to look at. We're doing this filming right here on Elm Avenue, which is one block away from the Avenue M Studios that was once the Vitagraph, Vitaphone, NBC Studios. And uh, I've lived here since 1979, and believe it or not, I had no idea that one block away was this great historic place. And a lot of people, when they found out where I, where I moved, they said, oh, you moved here because of the studios. And I said, what studios? I had no idea. And most of the people in this area really, really don't know about the great history that's right here. So for our first question, I'm going to turn to Mel. And I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit more uh, about these clips, as well as the field of media archaeology. Sure. Um, so you know, media archaeology, which I um, it, is, it, is a lot, is a trap, what's called, like, think if you read the article that I, it's a traveling media, traveling field, meaning it doesn't really, um, it's not really a discipline defined, but essentially what it suggests is that um, to uh, uh, reading against the, the, tr the convention of, of reading history and the history of media, particularly as a linear history, um, but um, be, uh, the one that presumes that, you know, new, newer media are, are sort of it's a, 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 a trajectory of progress, like media replace one another as in, in a kind of um, replacement and progress and things get better and higher definition, more definition, more this and that. Um, and things become obsolete. So what if we think about um, nonlinear histories of media? Um, where, what if we think about um, how media that don't seem related actually speak to each other directly um, or have a kind of continuum in terms of time, a more spiral hike or, or um, uh, twists and turns? What about, you know, in media technologies that kind of started but kind of um, hit a hit a failed, but then came back again in another form, um, which happens in the history of media, or if you do a kind of archaeological um, kind of investigation of it. It's also as a creative project. Um, for me, it's a, it's a uh, media archaeology is a, a making the history of media present in practice. So the, 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 you know, I'm really interested in the material and, you know, so media archaeology is kind of also very interested in material and materialism um, uh, and, you know, the, 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 the feel and the look of you, and shooting on film in particular is a kind of media archaeological kind of practice. Um, uh, so I would just say that, uh, you know, I took it very literally. Um, media archaeology doesn't necessarily um, look to um, look to especially the literature of archaeology as a, as a, as a social science interestingly enough um, but but um, 
but basically I Googled, I Googled, uh, you know, media archeologists and Brooklyn College and Kelly's name came up and I reached out to her. I said, would you be interested in doing a, you know, a, a, a dig? <laughs> I didn't even know what I was asking for at the time. <laughs> I knew nothing about archeology. span um, uh, On the site of this, you know, this, what you probably don't know is, a, is an old movie studio that's down the street from you. And she was, immediately game and I couldn't and I you know learned so much from her and also made a friend um, and we had a you know kind of fat it was a fascinating to to to, to be with her um, doing you know what she does um, and showing me what she does and um, and then she said that thing while we while she was digging about that when you do urban archaeology um, there it's you know even though Theoretically, or you know, in principle, there's this law of superposition where you know older should be on the bottom and newer on the top. But in fact, in urban spaces, things get things get twisted. And like that was sort of the you know where I what I was learning in the research I was doing for my film about the sort of histories of of, of the site where the biograph studios used. To be. So that that's how it all came together. That's awesome. Um, we just have been talking about it in my classes and seeing even more similarities yeah. between the two fields. And um, even aspects of like the law of superposition with the swirl in urban spaces, but this aspect of like a cultural deposition process. Essentially, that's what you're, you're exploring in many ways with the film. You're, you're, you're exploring the process mm -hmm. of how all of the film media sort of came to be, and it's not necessarily linear, right. as you stated. Right. So I found that really fascinating. To continue with some of these similarities between the archaeologies, this film highlights the history of race and racialization in cinema. Identity themes, particularly race, racialization, and ethnicity, are salient topics in archaeology, as most of my students will probably be aware. Mainly because the materiality, which you get to also, can unveil the histories that are tied to them, right? And these histories tend to be the histories that are ignored, silenced, and are not in the written record. So I want to show this extended clip. It's a scene with Kara. So Kara comes into play here, which comes a little later in the film for those that have seen it. And it eloquently captures this aspect, theme of race and racialization in film. On July 4th, 1910, a resounding left hook catapulted the race question to the center of public debates over the moving pictures. Black pugilist Jack Johnson knocked the great white hope Jim Jeffries nearly unconscious. A dozen motion picture cameras stationed at the arena in Reno, Nevada captured the action. Johnson's playful banter, a furious crowd, and Jeffries limp against the ropes. Jack Johnson was the first black heavyweight boxing champion of the world, and not coincidentally, its first black moving picture star.
On July 13, 1910, Jack Johnson and Etta Duria arrived at East 14th Street in Brooklyn, New York, the site of the Vitagraph Film Company's sprawling motion picture studio. They were a striking couple, even more recognizable than the top-billed actors of the era, like the stylish Florence Turner, known as the Vitagraph Girl, or the matinee idol Maurice Costello. But even if Johnson had not won the heavyweight title, his name emblazoned on headlines across the world, the couple would have elicited stares. Johnson was black and Duria white, at a time when the color line between black men and white women was drawn with miscegenation laws and enforced by lynching. Johnson and Duria had arrived to watch the film of the July 4th prize fight. The production company arranged the private exhibition for the filmmakers, the couple, and a few close associates. Johnson sat close to the screen, next to Duria, and waited until the invited guests were seated before he took off his coat. The lights were dimmed, and Johnson's larger-than-life image flashed across the screen. As the figures jostled and swayed, the delighted champion provided the audience with a running commentary of the match. The Johnson Jeffries Prize fight was a pivotal moment in the intertwined history of modern cinema and race. Ultimately, legislation passed in response to Johnson's victory created mechanisms to regulate images of blackness on screen. Thank you. So I'm going to direct this question now to you, Kara. Um, as film was created and later popularized in the late 19th and early 20th centuries during the Progressive Era, how did this early cinema sort of provide a, a window, as you might say, into sort of this notion of an emerging American identity, right? And are we seeing any of these lingering effects today? Well, I think, um, you know, one thing to remember when you think about early film, uh, like the, the, the first kind of major um, exhibition, the first major film screen that everybody recalls is like the moment that um, the moving pictures were emerged in popular culture. That happened in 1896. Have you ever been to um, the Macy's in Midtown? At, at that site, it was a, it was a music hall called Costume Bell's Music Hall. So that happens in 1896. Um, and in the same year, right, you have this really important court decision being made, which involved um, a black man who tried to ride in the white section of a train, um, Homer B. Plessy, right? So these two things happen at the very, very same time, right? And so when the moving pictures, as it becomes more and more popular, right? Um, you know, like 20% of the population is going every single week. Um, it's, it's, it's happening in this landscape, in this world where there's racial segregation, right? And Plessy versus Ferguson, right? It's this court decision, um, separate but equal, of course not equal. People um, that go to theaters are going into spaces where um, if you are not white, you're forced to sit in what was often called the buzzer spruce, which were like the worst seats in the house. Um, many black Americans then started to um, exhibit their own films and you know, different venues like their churches or their schools, or their halls. But it was something that was really segregated, right? Um, and that happens, it's reflected also on the screen because of the fact that the early American film industry um, and then Hollywood was really trying to appease um, its, its white audience. It was trying to make film a, res a respectable thing. And that included um, what people called the Southern market, which was really like the racist market, not just in the South. Um, and it kind of had this effect of, you know, had, what is that proposition that California um, rules? So sometimes when you get like vitamins or like, like products, it's like, this might cause all sorts of problems, okay. right? And they, they say- Like a the, warning the, or sort? Yeah, it's like this warning. They say the effect of that is um, so that like it standardizes 
or it regulates, even though it's just for California, the national production of all these different kinds of products, right? People try to fit it so that they don't get that warning on their labels, right? Um, and the same thing kind of happens with, with film, right? Because there is this certain percentage of the population that is racist, that is horrified to see any sort of images of black humanity on screen, for example. And so the, the moving picture industry really appeases that audience, right? Because um, it, that's, that's who they view as like part of their main, um, their main market for film. And because of that, you really don't have at the national level a lot of ang enough anxiety over this new kind of medium to be able to create like national level censorship regulations. It all happens like at the state level and the local level. And at this time, people are like, film is, is art, right? And so it's protected by what amendment? First, First amendment, right? Um, and it's not commerce, right? It's not a business. Um, that, though, all kind of comes into crisis um, when Jack Johnson um, defends his title as the, the heavyweight champion of the world, right? Because um, he had won the title before, and then um, all of these, like, racist people got really mad, really upset about it. Um, they find this former heavyweight champion, Jim Jeffries, who becomes known as the Great White Hope, and they... You know, they set up this other, this new match in 1910, and they're certain that Jim Jeffries is going to win, right? He's going to redeem the white race, um, and everything will go back to how it used to be, right? Um, so they get all these cameras. There's like 12 cameras in the arena, and they film this scene or this, this match that's supposed to uh, show the supremacy of the white race. What happens? Um, Jim Jeffries loses. Um, Jack Johnson wins, and suddenly there's like all of this momentum to create um, at the national level some way of regulating those film films from being shown to people, right? So again, right, this kind of um, entwining of the history of, of, of cinema, um, especially in the United States, with these racial regimes. Um, and two things happen, actually. The first thing is that Jack Johnson... Um, he's considered especially threatening, not just because he won this, this, the world championship, but also because he, um, he dated and was married to a white woman. And that's the woman that, that he came to the Vitagraph Studios with. They found one of his ex-girlfriends and, um, they basically built this case around the fact that he had paid for her to come and visit him across state lines. Um, and then they accused him of the Mann Act. They said that constituted kidnapping and accused this man, who was the son of former slaves, of engaging in, in the slave trade. They called it white slavery at the time. So they're trying to regulate this individual, this person. At the same time, there's something that's passed called the Sims Act, and that redefines film from being art to being commerce. Because if you define it as commerce, that means that the Constitution, because of the Commerce Clause, right, it becomes a federal issue. And they can regulate, right, the, the transportation of film across state borders. So there's two things going on, and they're, like, deeply, deeply interconnected, right? The, the regulation of images of black people on the screen, um, right, the, the regulation of um, black bodies in theaters, right, in, in theatrical spaces um, and non-white non people, and then, um, and then the actual individual human beings, right, who are, um, in the case of Jack Johnson, being um, um, convicted of, of white slavery. Wow, that's, that's intense. Um, to sort of move to, actually, this is a perfect time to move to this question. Um, this idea of monumentality and its discontents is really another theme that runs through and presents itself to the viewer in this film. <laughs> and it deeply overlaps with a whole lot of other disciplines. The connection between monumentality and memory, really, whether it's physical or visual, is deeply felt within the film. So 
sort of continuing on a little bit of this conversation, I first want to go to this next clip, which illustrates some of these entanglements between the monumentality and memory. My name is Aviva Braun, and I went to the Shalameth School for Girls for 12 years, probably there from 1982 or three, I would say. But my family goes way back in that building, so my dad went to high school there. I think he graduated probably late 60s, I would say. And then I have three sisters who also attended the school, and so we have a long family history of being in that building. My family, I grew up modern Orthodox but the school was, was just orthodox. Uh, but I would say over the years it got more observant in, more in their practice. We also got uniforms when I was in seventh grade, which a lot of people were very split about. I never knew that it was actually like a movie studio at one point. I remember the NBC studios was across the street. I remember we were big fans of the Cosby show back then, and I remember like we went, actually, my father very much liked to meet celebrities, and we watched it as a family every Thursday night, and one time I have pictures even of us going to meet the stars of the show, like, after. I do remember then it was like Days of Our Lives was filmed there and some other soap operas. So we would see sometimes soap opera stars when we'd go out on lunch in high school and that would be kind of really exciting. You would walk on Avenue M and for lunch like all the stores were basically kosher. It'd be very easy to find kosher lunches when you were allowed to go out in high school. Avenue M had like, you know, a bunch of kosher pizza stores, a bagel store, kosher bakeries. You know, a lot of them were accessory stores for women and girls. There was a hat store, I don't know if it's still there like right on the corner of like 14th and Avenue M. There's a famous butcher that's been there since the 70s. It's called Clatmart. I hate to say it, but I do feel like I was sort of taught to fear the other and not connect with people who weren't Jewish. Um, we were very insulated and I think that, um, you know, yeah, I think that like, I remember our teachers saying, you know, that they're like dangerous, the kids that go to Morrow, or they're like, like we should like stay away, or like you would hear stories of like, oh, a kid brought a knife to school or something. Like, I definitely remember not building an alliance, I would say, with the neighboring school. So, I'd like to pose this next and uh, interesting question to both of you. Um, we've talked a bunch about the dark histories that haunt the materiality in the landscape. You see it in the Vitagraph uh, smokestack. While its media history, of course, is, is not necessarily uh, showing that, it's sort of unseen um, and goes much deeper. Um, can both of you really discuss how or what your thoughts are on the role of film and the role of media historians in sort of problematizing these kind of dark paths that sort of haunt the, the media landscape. Um, and also, how, how do you go forth with them? You know, they have um, outlived their makers, they've out, you know, lived their context, and they will outlive us. So not just sort of what we do with them now, but how do you, how do you go forth with that as well? This is for both of you and yeah, anything yeah, yeah. else you want to chime in. It kind of relates a little bit back to uh, Kara's points. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, well, it also goes back to this question maybe of why I'm interested in media archaeology or sort of a nonlinear, um, uh, not teleological kind of approach to doing, doing a historical um, appraisal of media, which is that um, if you if you go back further, like even like sort of into geologic time or, you know, not in, you know, and outside of sort of a Western, a Western presumption about the invention of media, um, you can start to think about, you know, 
how how different um, uh, different trajectories of 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 the development of um, of anti-blackness and anti-Semitism and other kinds of discriminatory um, uh, 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 nativism in, in the United States um, had everything to do with the development of, of, of media, of, of filmed entertainment and even of, of television and up to today. So where am I getting at? Um, so doing this project, what, I, what, what again became tricky was, you know, not only did I learn things that were not pleasant about the person who I thought of as like the father of animation and the, the co-founder of the studio, Jay Stewart Blackton, but also on the site, you know, was Cosby Show was filmed there, the first season of Cosby Show. We know we kind of can't talk about Cosby Show without, you know, bringing up, um, you know, the sort of, um, you know, despicable acts that we have done that we know that Bill Cosby committed. Um, there's also um, discussion of Fatty Arbuckle, another like really complicated character who's, who was a silent film um, comedy actor. He was like a big, big, like large guy. He's, he's in the film, so you see it. Um, but he was accused um, and perhaps committed um, a horrible um, rape and murder of a, of a young actress. He was acquitted three times. Um, so, um, so this film started to also emerge at a time when we were um, we were also thinking about monuments, you know, mm -hmm. monuments to where uh, I was making the film at the time when we were really thinking about um, you know uh, uh, civil rights era monuments, monuments to um, to to um, uh, to 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 slave to slave owners um, to you know we we were. We were complicating what we do with monuments, and it seems like this film started to be complicated to me for those very reasons. And also um, because, I, as I said, you know, I've sort of committed my my much of my life and work to thinking about film and making films, and knowing that film itself has a really complicated history um, uh, with respect to particular um, individual creative people. Um, you know, asking the question of what do you do with um, art that you like made by a creator who's done terrible, done or said terrible things, um, and how do we resolve that? I've been, I've been, re I just finished a book that's pretty interesting by an author named Claire Detter called um, "Monsters: A Fan's Dilemma." Um, which asks that question, like, what do you do, um, you know, it's the, you know, what do you do with art, made, you know, can you separate art from the artists? Um, can you, can you, what do you do then also as a consumer, can you consume art that was when you know that the, the maker of it did terrible things? So this keeps coming up all the time. We just have Diddy and, you know, it, it just, it never stops. Um, so. I don't have an answer for it. it. The only thing I can think is that we can tell uh, uh, more inclusive stories um, about about the kind of about media and media's history um, that you know that that make sure that we understand the complicated nature of of the art that we're consuming. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my yeah. Point. I mean, I think that that makes like as you're talking about this, I'm like thinking about your squirrel, the yeah. squirrel oh, oh, right, 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 and like just how, you know, if we, if we talk about something, we just need to continually contextualize it and, and think about things, not just, you know, in a, in a, in a bubble, but how complex so many things are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And that was, it was also the, do this, you know, repeating that, that, Thing throughout the film, um, you know, it was a kind of challenge to myself to deal materially with this gesture that seems like you know just kind of a, a, a decorative, a decorative kind of flourish, particularly in in the um, in what was considered this you know kind of first animation, which uh, which you see at the end, um, which was. Um, various phases of funny, funny faces, phases of funny, funny faces, faces yeah, yeah. by, by Jay Stewart Blackton. 
Um, and he has that flourish in it. And, and, um, and so by me retracing it and re, you know, over and over again, um, you know, it was sort of a way, there was a lot of reasons why I did it, but one was to sort of um, actually kind of practice and implicate myself in the in the, in a de in the work in the deed of of somebody that and that whose beliefs I you know strongly detest um, uh, as a, as a challenge in a way but oh you know there's also the you know there's the swirls that keep getting mentioned in in yeah. the various um, approaches to doing histories and also you know, film itself is a swirl, right? The reels go round and round and you sort of can't even, I can't think about films without thinking about spirals. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of almost like a, a meditative uh, action yeah. as well, right? Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because that's sort of how you used it through your film is mm -hmm. to like meditate on yourself and your relationship with that. Yeah. I found. Really, really interesting. Kara, did you want to add anything else to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, when you were talking earlier, Kelly, about um, stories, mm -hmm. you know, historians, um, stories, and <laughs> were the they? name of the discipline, right? Um, you know, and, and telling those stories, and I think why it's important um, for historians to always be writing new histories of the past is because. Um, uh, you know, you're contextualizing the past for a certain moment, which I think is a different project than what some people might say the presentist is, right? Just reading the past through the lens of the present, um, just a slightly different, you know, kind of thing, though there's, there's some connections. Um, and, and really thinking about, you know, um, historians right now have kind of con I think are confronting more than in 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 previous generations the fact that archives, um, which are the materials that we use to talk about the past, which are usually printed materials of some sort or locked away in um, these libraries or or you know Library of Congress archives collections, are really um, are very biased. They're things that um, um, have been selected by certain people who valued um, various kinds of histories over other kinds of histories. And so what does that mean to be a historian when there's these big absences or gaps um, in, in our understanding of the past, right? Um, and so some historians are turning to different kinds of methods. Um, one of them is like, called speculative history, where we mm -hmm. kind of speculate, right? Um, but I also think that's a really important place for art to come in, for uh, for film to come in, um, for other ways of kind of thinking through the the, the feelings or the, the affect of, of, of the past in ways that we don't have captured in traditional archives. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you bring up the speculative because that's just recently sort of entered into anthropology. There's a speculative ethnography. I'm starting to dive into speculative archaeology and this aspect of, you know, sort of excavating the future in many ways, right? Um, and I think it provides a, um, a real reflexive place that you can go to, right? And, and tie not just these aspects of the archives and sort of um, expose them for, for all of their biases, but also start to think about how can we change this for the future, right? And speculative, um, almost, you know, you could go either way. You could go a dystopian view, you could go a utopian view, you can go a variety of ways, but it does provide these ways of, of sort of looking, which I find really, really uh, useful, yeah. I mean, I would just say, you know, speaking of, you know, sort of silences of the archives and biases in the archives, and what, you know, again, when I had ever previously encountered um, phases of funny faces as a, as a, you know, as a 
touchstone of the history of animation. They never show. I, I've never. I never saw the. Um, the I'm sorry for the offense. The Cone and Coon um, sequence that that is shown in the film, and it's triggering. And and you know it's a triggering sequence. And you know I struggle with as to whether to put it in the film, but. Um, but it was never, I never encountered it um, in any sort of histories of animation that I had, that I had learned about. So if you go to the Library of Congress, which is where I got the clip, and you look up, you know, um, the, fate, the Stuart Blackton phases of funny faces, that's not the highlight. You don't see that portion of it, but it's, it's part of, it's part of the, the, the entire 1906 um, animation. Um, and it, you know, it just, it sort of threw me at the, when I, when I saw it. And again, I sort of, it challenged me to, you know, again, rethink um, what I knew and what I understood about um, media history, animation history, um, and even the history of this place where I live. Yeah. That kind of gets to a question, although I'm not a media studies expert, how do you sort of mine the gap? <laughs> want to use the phrase, in terms of those spaces that are biased or have left out of the archive um, that you might stumble upon or like how do you how do you how do you deal with those components sort of technically in your work? I mean, well, I'm, I'm also interested in these sort of speculative possibilities, right? You know, thinking about um, the what ifs, like what if, what if things were actually different? What, how would we, uh, how would we, um, uh, what would things look like now? So you can sort of fabulate about um, different things. I think to the extent that 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 I do that in in this film, um, I think this, let's see, the, the, a kind of speculative um, aspect might be discerned in it by I think by noticing that the various different um, voices that you hear, like I mentioned at the beginning, often conflict and and don't and they, they don't tell a coherent story actually, um, and and that's you know I think that opens up a place for another uh, possible possible way of thinking about about history and place, particularly history, place, memory, monuments. Yeah. You know. That reminds me a lot of artifacts, you know, mm -hmm. what, uh, another sort of thing that's been um, sort of uh, a new trend, or not really new, but becoming more popular in archaeology is to go back and revisit these old collections. So mm -hmm. they've been evaluated, they have this one interpretation, and now you have new eyes looking at it that can provide a very different interpretation mm -hmm. based off of your own experiences, new theories, new components, etc. So I find, once again, similarities are yeah really funny and we were um be, before we we um uh, we were talking earlier about animation too yeah. mm -hmm. and that kind of got me thinking about a lot of the um the sort of things that historians um and other people would call you know visual evidence right so like we have a film of a certain event there there's you have the film of the jack johnson fight right mm -hmm. but you know, other things that are lost and how, how um, you know, animation or things might be able to step in um, mm -hmm. and to help us think through some of those historical mm -hmm. gaps and, and things in the art. Oh, yeah, that's true. I guess the squirrel is a kind of speculative kind mm -hmm. of gesture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure that we have enough time for Q&A for everyone because there's a lot of students here and I know I ask my students to all come up with questions. So I'd like to just first pose a, a Q&A session for the audience, but I'd like to open it up first to students, for any student that'd like to ask a question. I think we have this down here, right, the microphone? If you have a question, come on down and, and ask, or a comment even. Haddad, you want to come down? <laughs> you have good questions. Uh, uh, we'll, go, we'll, we'll do an order. Yeah. My question is short. Um, 
Do I need a microphone? Well, it's being recorded, so okay. that's fine. So my question is, like, in the, in the film, you have a lot of scenes of just the Earth flo floating around through space. Mm, yeah. And um, I just want to understand, like, why you chose to include that. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I mean, a couple reasons. One is, you know, to another way of thinking about this rotation and swirl, like the Earth rotates, you know, th in, in thinking about um, doing history and, and digging things up. That if you, I mean, nobody would notice this, but it, it's actually going backwards. It's actually, it's actually going <laughs> against, it's not rotating clockwise, it's going backwards. So we're kind of going backwards in time. Um, but then, it, you know, then we, then it also, corresponds to um, to the mapping and the Google map or Google Earth, you know, you know, we actually go from, you know, being able to look at the site where the where the smokestack is and zooming out here and, you know, kind of the Earth view, view. But then that Google Earth view, actually, um, the, the, the globe also is the as the world turns globe. Um, so it kind of, it, it becomes this thing that connects all these different pieces, or I hope it connects the pieces um, in some way of this, you know, what what turned out to be like just what, you know, kind of wildly associative um, fragments of, of the history that kind of come together through these visual motifs, I hope. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I had a question more on the production side. Throughout the movie, a lot of the shots seem very temporary, I think the word would be. Like, they seem very, like, not like a film, more like it was done by hand. Oh, yeah. I wanted to know how you got that effect. Yeah, like, barely there, yeah. Yeah, almost, like, disintegrating. Um, so, yeah, diff different ways. Um, uh, sometimes I use, um, exp oh, so it's shot on, a lot of it is shot on 16 millimeter film. And sometimes I use 16 uh, expired stock, so I actually don't know what it's gonna look like. And sometimes you get that very, uh, like you said, like it's almost it's it's barely an image, like it's almost falling apart. Um, and sometimes I um, like when you when you see the black and white footage with all the kind of like lines going around on it, that's hand processed, um, meaning that I'm putting it in the chemicals myself by hand rather than. Um, sending it to a laboratory, and you get all this sort of residue of the chemical. And, it, and to me, it, it you know, it it's a again, it's process based, so it kind of um, becomes analogous to the the the, the archaeological kind of um, process of digging through things, of of, of di digging through different different media forms. So you know, there is. There is film, but there's also video. There's also um, lidar, you know, Google Earth, like you know, um, imagery. Um, so it's like a, all, all, all different and and different kinds of 16 millimeter, different stocks. It's like putting all of all the material histories of media into one messy film. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. Thanks. Thanks. Are there any other students that have any questions? Oh, awesome. I know the film is very focused on the past history of the film studio, yeah. but I'm just thinking about in my own lifetime, there's been sort of a boom in new studio development around Brooklyn. Yeah. And I was wondering in particular about the new Navy Yard studios that are also situated in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood yeah. now. Yeah. And did you think about kind of that at all present state of the you know, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know too much about, isn't the, is the, the, the Brooklyn College is, our graduate program is over there. Yeah. Is there. <laughs> yeah, your graduate program is there. Um, so, uh, you know, I haven't done much, um, you know, much, much, his, like, research into that particular community, but it is interesting and, 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 and an, an interesting parallel that these, um, uh, historic spaces where media was created um, evolved into these orthodox enclaves. Um, and why that might be, I mean, they, they were always, they were always um, spaces um, 
I mean, here in Midwood, um, the 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 influx of, of uh, Orthodox residents really happened um, like 60s and 80s. I think it's I think it's a much uh, longer history in William, in in the Navy Yard Williamsburg area, um, but it has to do with um, immigration patterns. It has to do with um, uh, the cost of the cost of housing in particular neighborhoods. Um, so where there's lots of space and studio space, there's also sometimes less less expensive housing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it is interesting. I think we had two students over here, one here and one up. Okay, so I had a question that was more about like I guess the filming of it because as I was watching it, I noticed that maybe it's because Halloween's rolling around, but it seemed a little bit like spooky to me, like a little horror. Like I was yeah. getting a little bit of like Blair Witch Project yeah. <laughs> moments. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, what I thought yeah. was like purposeful. There's like a point to it. Yeah, I mean, I think probably the music also maybe makes that even more so. Yeah, I mean, it's a haunted history. I, I guess, I guess when. I, I love that you notice that or, or even find that in it. Um, uh, like when I'm, we're looking at this, um, we look at the, the smokestack a lot and it does seem it's kind of ghostly and haunting and, and, and almost ominous. Um, and, and yeah, sure, I did like make it even more so with the selection of, of the particular use of the score, which is sometimes kind of grating and, and whiny and, and sometimes low and, and, and ominous and um, yeah but I think it goes to like I'm telling I'm getting I'm, I'm, I'm moving you through a uh, a tale that's not going to get any it's not going to end well <laughs> I mean it kind of does but but it, the film itself doesn't end in a, in a happy place um, uh, so I'm glad you noticed that yeah um, so, in the beginning of the film, they talk about how the neighborhood used to be way safer, that there were more shops that were more inclusive, and there were good quality products. Yeah. And then later in the film, we talk about how they're like black racism, and how Jewish people, Orthodox Jewish people in this neighborhood were taught to be more closed minded yeah. and more separated. And I want to figure out how you think that relates. Yeah, how to how to um, how those to square those two space places. I mean, I think I think that the um, the the store owner who we're interviewing um, he owned owned a shoe store and was sort of reminiscing about how the neighborhood used to be when um, when the um, when there was uh, also. Uh, the, the soap opera was filming and there was a lot more activity in the streets and a lot more activity of, um, of both the actors being around, the, uh, the, the population and the demographics of the neighborhood um, changing. Um, I think to your question about um, the kind of uh, exclusions and, and, and sense of belonging um, and sense of um, privileged belonging even, um, of the Orthodox community in 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 in, um, in Midwood, um, you know that's one that you know, that Aviva, who's who's talking about and reminiscing about her time um, as a student at at the, at, at Shawamath, um, has come to regard with some, you know, with some hesitation, with some some ambivalence about about it, um, and I think that's kind of this. The, a, a history of of of, um, of of the neighborhood, like it, it's go, it goes in cycles of, of different kinds of of senses of who belongs, right? Um, and you probably feel that and recognize it even being here in Midwood today. Yeah. Well, you talk about the neighborhood from years ago. And I remember that neighborhood from more than 50 years ago, yeah. when it was a much more different type. And I remember all kinds of restaurants on, on Avenue M, Italian restaurants, mm -hmm. the, um, oh yes, and Jewish restaurants, but not, not the type today. You know, mm -hmm. I guess the old style delis mm -hmm. that were 
kosher but not glad kosher. Mm -hmm. They'd be open on Saturday, but they had carried Hebrew National and stuff like that. And also the Elm Theater. Oh, yeah. I can't forget that. You know, I don't know what that, I forget what that building is now, but I remember that very well. Um, anyway, and yeah. so I, I, I just, when I saw the pictures of the street, that all came back to my mind, mm -hmm. what I remember from back in the 60s and 70s, yeah. you know, which is a long time ago now. But, but you would have remembered the the all the television production probably what? The, the television production that was happening um, in the in what became the Vita Phone Studio. So in the seventies, the first season of Saturday Night Live, there was lots of NBC productions were here. So when, yeah. Now that was in the what we're talking about by the Brighton Line. That's where it all took place. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, when did they stop? What year did they stop using that to produce these shows? What, what, what? So 2010, um, as as the world turns, went dark. But then they they shot they shot some films there for a few years later. That's across the street from the original um, Vitagraph building. It's now it's now the um, Ohel uh, Ohel Family Services, and there's also um, a, a store a huge storage storage space. Um, I know it's the end of class for many of you, so I appreciate you being here and waiting till the end. Um, is there anyone else that would like to ask a question, though? Is there, there's this is up to anyone. Student, non-student. Um, I just had a question. Oh. This is uh, you just talk up loud because people are leaving. Thank uh, you. This is about uh, more about broader about media because you guys were talking about like archival stuff. Um, so modern technologies like with streaming services and all of that, do you guys think that is beneficial or detrimental to archival preservation? The rate of which um, like streaming services delete just media and that media becomes lost. Do you think that's a, like a net gain or a loss for preserving diverse stories? Streaming services. I mean, I think, I don't think it's the technology itself as much as how the technology is um, is used and um, by these um, corporations that have very specific, you know, they're interested in, they're not interested in preservation, right, or <clears throat> even dissemination of, of the media, that's not their main goal. Their main goal is profit, mm -hmm. right? So if you put that tool in the hand of, um, you know, some other um, uh, organization that might be more invested in those things, um, I don't think it's the, the inherent issue of the technology. It's the, it's, it's who controls it and, and, and what their intent is. Mm -hmm. So that was literally part of my question, one of the questions I had, because I was really interested in this conversation about the archive, and as a millennial that's been on social media for years, we're seeing like people buy up social media sites and like delete things and delete things like movies and shows that are really impactful for certain audiences, so I thought that was a really interesting thing. But I also wanted to ask a little bit, I really was intrigued by the funny faces at the end because I was caught off guard when I saw it. Um, and I'm glad you explained why, because I really, in conjunction with that and the Jack Johnson piece, I was wondering in what ways that you all could speak about how film and media during the 20th century begins to reify or reaffirm a lot of the racial boundaries that we start to see in America. Because in 1915, we, of course, know Birth of a Nation comes out and it's shown at the White House and it's like a massive success. It leads to the reemergence of the KKK and lynching takes off. So I really would like to hear some of your thoughts on like media in the 20th century and how it kind of reaffirms these racial boundaries that are really important for America. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. I mean, I think what what Kara's research is why is so important, and I would recommend her book highly. Um, is she points exactly to this moment, except, including of to understanding the um, the impact of Birth of a Nation um, to before that moment, uh, before Birth of a Nation, to understanding how um, how how Cinema became racialized, or how let's call it, all of all of um, all of commercial media um, 
has a uh, racial balance to it um, because of this, particularly because of this legal legal um, decision that made it from art into commerce and therefore could be regulated. Um, and therefore it was, it was um, paralleling the regulation of particularly um, black bodies, uh, you know, and, and movement and limitations, the same sorts of limitations that were put on um, on uh, black Americans were being put on any kind of media that featured um, uh, color. Is that right? Yeah, and, and I mean, I think, you know, it's it's really it's really a chicken and the egg kind of story when we talk about media. It's just inseparable. It's part mm -hmm. of it's part of culture and society. It's, it's embedded together, and you know, we say, um, you know, uh, arts is it art mimics life or oh, yeah. whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then you have things like um, life mimicking art with Birth of a Nation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, the Klan, the original Klan, right, which existed during the Reconstruction era, they would wear calico dresses. They would wear, like, just little sacks over their head. They would dress up in blackface. Um, the Klan that we now see as the Klan with their pointy hats and they're all white, that comes from Birth of a Nation, right? The Basically, the person who revives the birth of the Asian after it was sent underground um, during the Reconstruction era is this like failed minister and like failed pantyhose salesman um, mm -hmm. from Georgia. And he watches the movie and he's like just a complete loser in life. And he's like, oh, these are all my problems, right? Um, it must be because of these other people. We have to revive the Klan. And so he watches the movie and he gets like people to go out and parade in these outfits that are designed after the film, right? People, they're just a bunch of people um, mm -hmm. who are copying the film and then making this claim to this like longer, older organization, right? So, so yeah, it's very entwined and weird. But at the same time, Birth of a Nation, it was successful, but it was also in many ways a, a big failure. There were so many protests against the film and you know we could really make the argument that the first mass black protest movements of the 20th century, which include Canada, which include France, which include right all of these places throughout the United States, um, those were galvanized by Black Americans who were also part of the a critical part of the making of American cinema, right? And they're fighting for this thing that they have helped to create, and they're like, that's not that's not our cinema, right? And so you have this mass protest movement, which is really one of the major reasons that like organizations like the NAACP um, exist on the scale that they exist today, um, because of uh, many organizations, many people were organized and they were like, let's start a branch of the NAACP so we fight um, the exhibition of the film. Wow, that's really interesting. One last question, <laughs> Uh, yeah. It's a speculation and a uh, um, recommendation and a question. Um, so the speculation is like it could have been different. Um, so, so much of what we have to do with um, media is counter the international image of black Americans um, that became that is reified through cinema um, and through TV. And like the issue of representation wouldn't be an issue if it hadn't developed this way. So just speculating about that. Past, um, the recommendation is a book called, a comic called um, Wake by um, Rebecca Cross. And she's an um, archivist who's going and trying to find the stories of women who led um, revolts on slave ships and um, in communities, but it's the archivist is very um, much in the story and she's um, blo blocked out of places, locked out. Um, and then the question is, the archive now is all of our phones and all we're like we're all makers and it's not just centralized in a studio so how 
will you possibly do archaeology of the images we've created? That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, people are making, I think, I think, you know, create, I think it becomes up to creative artists to figure that out. I mean, you know, yeah, I, I wouldn't, uh, librarians and archivists and, um, and preservationists have, well, you know, their job continues to get more complex. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I hope that the intervention of um, creative makers um, allows for different kinds of ways of dealing with um, with knowledge or making knowledge, um, yeah, I, I think that's where, you know, we turn to artists to think of, you know, because they actually create knowledge in different ways. Um, so I guess that's where we go with that, thinking about, you know, what's available and using it in really subversive ways. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you all for staying here. Um, sadly, we're going to have to end the event. Mm -hmm. We're at that time. I want to thank Mel and Kara for their time, thoughts, and amazing film. Mm -hmm. And um, for students, if you haven't signed up, please make sure that you do so you get credit for this, if it's extra credit or for your class. And thank you all again. Thank the Wolf Institute as well. Thank you. Thank you.